Today's Bible study is entitled Time and the Beauty of the Lord. Time and the Beauty of the Lord. I love the way that the Bible begins. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. It gives us comfort and solace that there is a God who is in charge of the earth and the universe at large. To live in a thought process of having no God is hopelessness indeed. And the Bible tells us that God is there and he is the creator. The word of God says in Psalm 33 verse 6, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made. And in verse 9, For he commanded and he stood fast. Our God is great, our God is good, our God is powerful. In, in Revelation chapter 19 verse 6, the Bible says, Hallelujah. For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. And so we need to be glad and rejoice that the Bible starts with in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. He is in charge of our lives. We ought to look up to him for grace, for power, for wisdom, for knowledge, for discernment, for understanding. Especially as we live in these last days. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11, he hath made everything beautiful in his time. Yes. Now, the Bible tells us that God created in six days and rested on the seventh day. Well, the Lord could have spoken everything in one day. He has the power, he has the ability, he has the capacity. He is God. But he makes everything beautiful in his time. He decided in his mind that he would create in six days and rest on the seventh day. And lo and behold, that's what he did. For his counsel stand forever. The Bible tells us, in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, that God made man in his own image after his likeness. When he made man in his own image and his likeness, he was so very happy because Adam and Eve reflected God. Adam and Eve were looking like God. Of course, human beings have their limitations, but the glory of the Lord was upon Adam and Eve. But the Bible tells us in Romans 3.23, that after sin, humanity came short of the glory of the Lord. God was sad that the glory of the Lord, which is nothing but his character, has been marred to a great extent. Because of sin, mankind lost the beauty of holiness. When they came forth from the hand of the creator in the likeness and the image of God, they had the beauty of the Lord or the beauty of holiness in them. What about the earth before sin? The Bible says in Genesis 1 verse 31, and God said, it is very good. He looked at the beauties of nature. He looked at the beauty of Adam and Eve. And everything that he made was so beautiful. God gave a big smile. 
He was well pleased and he said, it is very good. That means that the beauty of the Lord's design and purpose was seen in the creation of the earth. Now the Bible doesn't say as to when exactly sin entered into the beautiful world and marred everything. The Bible tells us in Genesis 3, 17 and 18, that curse began to come upon the face of the earth. The ground was cursed. Everything else upon the earth started experiencing the curse. In other words, when God said, it is very good, it was filled with the beauty of God, his design, his purpose. But God was sad once sin came for the beauty of mankind began to be defaced, to be marred. The beauty of the earth also was marred and step by step, it was losing the original beauty. Well, this morning, during the morning devotion, I read from the book, The Faith I Live By, wherein the pen of inspiration said about something which would happen in the future when God will create the, wor the world anew. She writes, when the blight of sin is removed, the whole earth shall appear in the beauty of the Lord. In other words, the design of God, the plan of God, the purpose of God, the intention of God would be fulfilled once again when the blight of sin is removed. The earth will be as beautiful, in fact, more beautiful than it was prior to the commencement of sin. So it was not just the beauty of holiness in people that was marred. Yes, it was after sin. And it is getting worse and worse as the days go by. But also the beautiful earth started reeling under the curse of sin. In Psalm 90, we have 17 verses in total. By whom was this Psalm written? Generally, when we think of Psalms, we think of David. Yes, David wrote most of the Psalms. Asaph wrote Psalms. But Psalm 90 was not written by David or anyone else, but it was written by Moses, a man of God. The Bible talks about Moses as the meekest man upon the face of the earth in those days. Now this psalm is his prayer. I told you Psalm 90 has 17 verses. But I would like to go to verse 17 first, the very last verse of that psalm. That verse says, and let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us. Now here, Moses is praying that the beauty of the Lord God be upon people, upon himself. And we need to have this prayer prayed as well on a regular basis. Lord, let the beauty, your beauty, which is the beauty of the Lord, be upon us. Moses recognized that beauty was lost after sin entered into the world. 
But here is the prayer from this man of God. Let the beauty of the Lord God be upon us. And establish thou in the work of our hands. Yes, this should be our prayer. Lord, establish your work in us. I would like to take you to another example, which is the book of Ecclesiastes. The book of Ecclesiastes, as we know, was written by Solomon, the king, the wise man. He prayed for wisdom and the Lord blessed him with great wisdom. Apart from Jesus Christ, he was the wisest man that lived upon the face of the earth. Now Solomon, in the book of Ecclesiastes, deals with various topics. He deals with the topic of time. And being a wise man, he talked extensively about being wise and wisdom. He also talked about the vanities of life, which he himself experienced for a while before he repented and came back strongly to the Lord. But Ecclesiastes has 12 chapters. But it ends with verses 13 and 14, that is Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14, brings us to the end of that book. Let us see what he says. I read. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Now, yes, he wrote about time. Yes, he wrote about vanities, he wrote about wisdom. But what was the most important point in his book of Ecclesiastes? He summarizes it or he highlights it, saying that the most important thing or the conclusion of the whole matter is at the end of his book in chapter 12, 13 and 14. Fear God. Now, this is the most important thing for mankind. For us, that's what even the three angels. And it says, and keep his commandments. Is the whole duty. Dear friends in the Lord. What should be the conclusion of our life's journey upon this earth? We do many things upon this earth. Yes, we have a lot of other things to do as well. But let's not forget that the conclusion of our life or the purpose and intention of our life from the point of God is that we fear him, that we keep his commandments and his grace is sufficient for all of us so that we would do the duty which the Lord has given us. And then in verse 14, as in the three angels' messages, it talks about judgment. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be of God or whether it be, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So Solomon, at the conclusion of the book of Ecclesiastes, brings forth the most important point of the book, that is, to fear God and keep his commandments. Now, friends, we're talking about time and the beauty of the Lord. What is this beauty of the Lord? We can get the answer from the Bible itself. In Psalm 29, verse 2. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord. In the beauty of holiness. Here is the answer. The beauty of the Lord. Is the beauty of his holiness. And we are told to worship him in the beauty of holiness. And worship is not just coming to church or having Bible study or singing praises. That is part of worship. Yes. But our life should be a life of worship having the beauty of holiness. It's only then God would be happy with us. 
In 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16, the Bible says, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. So, dear friends in the Lord, what is the beauty of the Lord? It is the beauty of the holiness of the Lord. And what did Moses pray for in the psalm? Let the beauty of the Lord be upon us. We need to pray, Lord, let the beauty of the Lord be upon our church. Let the beauty of the Lord be upon our families. Let the beauty of the Lord be upon our children. This is the prayer of God's people of all ages. So the beauty of the Lord is nothing but the beauty of the holiness of the Lord. When mankind sinned, they lost the beauty of the Lord, which is the beauty of holiness. In Hebrews 12 verse 14, the Bible says, Without holiness, no one shall see the Lord. Are we planning to see the Lord? Are we planning to be with him for eternity? Or are we content with this world which is so temporary and tentative in nature? It's so temporal. May we seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then all the things that are necessary for us would be granted to us by God. In his time, he makes all things beautiful. So without holiness, no one shall see the Lord. Do you want to see the Lord? Do you want to live with him forever? Do you want to be in a world where the blight of sin is going to be removed and the beauty of the Lord will be upon all his creation in the earth made new, including in his people? The beauty of the earth which is so marred today, will be brought back to its original beauty and even more beautiful, that is in the future. But the beauty of the Lord's character of holiness has to be seen in God's professed people in this world, now and in the days to come. For we are truly living in the end of time and Jesus our Lord is going to come soon. So without holiness, we will not see the Lord. That means that the beauty of the Lord is his character of holiness. Now, I would like to draw your attention to Psalm 90. While I was reading the Psalm, which consists of 17 verses, I saw something very unique that the psalmist here, in this case, it's Moses, he alludes to time in many of the verses that he wrote in Psalm 90. And he climaxes that Psalm 90 with verse 17 saying, let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us. I would like to repeat myself once again. In Psalm 90, there are many verses which bring the time factor into focus. And as in Ecclesiastes, at the end of the 12th chapter, Solomon says that the main thing is to fear God and to keep his commandments. Here, after writing 16 verses in Psalm 90, here is the psalmist saying in the last verse, let the beauty of the Lord be upon us. In other words, let the character of God be upon us. Personally speaking, let it be upon me, we need to pray. Now, I would like to take you to some verses in Psalm 90, reading from the Bible, which alludes directly or indirectly to the factor 
or the matter of time. Now Psalm 90 verse 1. Lord, thou hast been a dwelling place in all generations. Friends, where is it alluding to time here? Well, the word generation alludes to time. A generation, according to the Bible, is 40 years. Now, I like something here. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place. You know, we have dwelling places on earth. Some live in Bangalore, some live in Mangalore, some live in Goa, some live in Bombay, some live in America, and different parts of the earth. That is a dwelling place. If somebody asked me, Pastor David, where do you dwell? I would give them my earthly address. But here, there is something more beautiful for us to think about. It doesn't talk about an earthly dwelling place or an earthly address. It says, Lord, thou hast, thou hast been our dwelling place. Amen. We might dwell anywhere in this world, in this temporary world. But by faith, we have to be dwelling under the shadow of the Almighty, under the covert of his wings. Now let us go to the second verse. Again, you will find Moses alluding to time. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Where is it alluding here? Everlasting. Everlasting talks about time. From everlasting in the past to everlasting in the future. In other words, time immemorial in the past and the everlasting in the future. Thou art God. Praise God. From everlasting to everlasting, he is God. The earth was brought forth only 6,000 years ago. We were brought forth just a few years ago, personally speaking, according to our age. But praise God from everlasting to everlasting. There is somebody on his throne seated and ruling and reigning supremely. So here in verse 2, where Moses is alluding to time are the words everlasting to everlasting. Now let's go to verse four. For a thousand years is in thy sight, but as yesterday when it is past and as a watch in the night. Oh, here you have time, 1,000 years. Here you have another time, yesterday. And then you have a watch in the night. A watch consists of three hours each. We're starting from 6 p.m. to 9 is the first watch, then 9 to 12 the second watch, 12 to 3 the third watch, and the fourth watch is 3 to 6. So again here, at least in three places, time is alluded to. Now verse 5. Thou carriest them away as with a flood. They are as asleep. In the morning, they are like grass which groweth up. Which the word for us to pick as far as time is concerned? Morning. Morning is time. Let's go to verse 6. In the morning, time, it flourisheth and groweth up. In the evening, time, it is cut down and withereth. Over and over again, we find the psalmist bringing in the time factor. I don't think there is any other psalm in all the 150 psalms wherein time in a particular psalm is brought to light on so many occasions in so many different verses of the chapter. Now verse 9. For all our days are passed away in wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. Where is time? Days is time. Years is time. Now verse 10. For the days of our years are three score and ten. There you have it. Seventy years. Time. And if by reason 
of strength, they be four score years. Again, time is brought forth very, very clearly here. Our next verse, verse 12. So teach us, why, where is the so coming from? The so is the connecting word to the previous word verses. What did we read in verse 10? Our days are three score and 10 or four score years. In other words, God is from everlasting to everlasting, but we are temporal or temporary in nature here. We might live for 70, 80, 90, or maybe 100, but our time is short when compared to eternity. So the Bible says, teach us to number our days. It's not that we count one day, second day, third day, 99, 100. That's not the meaning of it. It says, Lord, help us to understand the purpose of time in our life, that we might apply our hearts unto wisdom, that we might live the time that thou hast given us upon this earth wisely, with discernment. Verse 13. Return, O Lord, how long? Let it repent thee concerning thy servants. Now where is time? How long? Now long, you know, we say, how long it took for us to go there and come back. What are we alluding to here? Time. Verse 14. Oh, satisfy us early with thy mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Again, time, days. Verse 15. Make us glad according to the days, time, wherein thou hast afflicted us. So dear friends in the Lord, in this chapter of Psalm 90, which has only 17 verses, we have almost in every verse, something alluding to time. What is the highlighting point? The time is needed and is given to us by God. For a main purpose. What is that purpose? That the beauty of the Lord our God be developed in us. Dear friends in God. We do not go to bed at night. As sinners. And wake up in the morning as saints. I repeat. We don't go to bed at night as sinners, and wake up in the morning as saints. Character is not developed overnight, but over time. Character is not developed overnight, but over time. You watch a fruit grow. I love to see fruits upon the tree. I love to see that after the flowers, after the flowering is over, the fruit slowly starts growing. I love to watch its progress until its maturity. Yes, it takes time for any fruit to mature. It takes time for any fruit to get its color, to get its taste. Yes, it matures over a period of time. The same with us as well. By God's grace, we have to have the maturity, the growth in holiness. In other words, as per today's title, that the beauty of the Lord be upon us. Joseph of old, one of the sons of Jacob. About him, we read in Genesis 39, verse 2 and 3. And the Lord 
was with Joseph. I like that. Don't you like that, friends? The Lord was with Joseph. You know, dear friends, the Lord, if you and I choose to be with the Lord, the Lord happily will choose to be with us through the good times and bad times of life. Joseph had his good times. Joseph had very bad times as well. But through both the good times and bad times of Joseph's life, when he was going through the valley of the shadow of death experiences, so to say, because he chose to set the Lord always before him, the Lord chose to be at his right hand. The Lord was with Joseph. Beautiful thought. Let the Lord be with me. Let the Lord be with you. And the Bible says, and he was a prosperous man. The Lord will uplift, lift up. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. But look at verse 3 of Genesis 39. And his master saw that the Lord was with him. And that the Lord made all that he did prosper in his hand. Look at verse three, uh, verse two once again. The Lord was with Joseph. What a blessing to have the Lord with us. Through the thick and thin of life. But when the Lord truly was with Joseph, his master saw that that was a matter of fact. Dear friends in the Lord, if we are with the Lord, if we spend time in the presence of the Lord, the Lord will choose to reveal himself to us. We will see the maturity of a beautiful Christian character. We will see the beauty of holiness being growing and being matured in our personal lives. And as in Joseph's case, his master noticed that. Oh, dear friends in the Lord, Jesus says, ye are the salt of the world, ye are the light of the earth. Oh, dear friends in the Lord, salt can be tasted. People have to see our lives and see that we are tasty. Our light has to shine in the darkness. And the Bible says that the Gentiles shall come to the light when they see light in us. The master saw that the Lord was with Joseph. Today, what do people notice about you and me? Is the Lord, be, is the Lord with you? Is the Lord with me? Make a choice to be with the Lord. The Lord will make a choice to be with you and me. And then slowly but surely, even as Joseph's master saw that fact, people, our neighbors, our friends, they will see that the Lord, they will see that the Lord was, who was with Joseph, will also be with us. Yes. What about Jesus? Jesus' life was a perfect display of the beauty of holiness. The beauty of the Lord God was upon the Lord Jesus as nobody else. Everyone else who were saints of God, they displayed the beauty of holiness, but Jesus was the sinless one. In John 14, verses 8 and 9, Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and thou hast not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Oh, what a testimony by the Lord himself. He said, If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. A perfect reflection of the Father was seen in Jesus. And Jesus in his prayer to the Father, he prayed like this, Lord, as thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I have sent them into the world. 
the father sent the son to show the beauty of the Lord upon this earth in humanity. And Jesus has kept us in this world for us to reflect the beauty of Jesus. The great Psalmist David, who wrote so many Psalms, which is such a comfort and solace to each one of us. In one of my favorite verses in the Bible, in Psalm 27 verse four, Many of us would have memorized it. I read, one thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after. Now look at this. There are many things to do in life. And David as the king had so many responsibilities to do. But he said, amidst all this, Amidst the many things of life, one thing is my desire. He says, I have desired of the Lord. Dear friends, the Bible tells us in Psalm 37, delight thyself also in the Lord and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Now Jesus told the rich young ruler who was religious, so to say, who kept the commandments of God externally, who had some respect and reverence to God. Jesus said, one thing you lack, go and sell all that you have and give to the poor. Now, what did he lack? He lacked the most important thing, the greatest essence in a follower of God's life. Love for humanity, love for the poor. In the same way, David is saying, this one thing is above all things in my life, and I desire this of the Lord. That means he's praying to the Lord that this desire be fulfilled. And then he's endeavoring towards its fulfillment, saying that, that will I seek after. I will seek after that one thing. And what is that one thing? That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Now, the house of the Lord, yes, here is the temple or the synagogue or the place of prayer. But, you know, we can take it this way as well, that we come in the presence of the Lord all the days of our life. Whether we be at home or we be on the streets or we worship God in the church, that we might dwell in the presence of God all the days of our life. We are talking about time and the beauty of the Lord. We do not know when our, our days will come to its end, especially during this time of the pandemic. You know, we look forward to uncertain days, but there is only one certainty, and that certainty is God. And so may we have this one thing, this one desire. May we pray to the Lord for that. May we seek after that. What is that? that I may dwell in the house or in the presence of the Lord all the days of my life. Dear friends in the Lord, make it the, make it the habit of spending more and more time in the presence of the Lord. And what was the reason for this prayer? Here's the psalmist saying, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Oh, we need to come into his presence for the same reason which David had in his great desire to behold the beauty of the Lord as you spend time daily. Behold this beauty of love, this beauty of holiness, the beautiful creation that he has made. Our God is omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, a loving God, a wise God a God who cares, a God who shares. Behold the beauty of the Lord and inquire in his temple. In other words, keep praying, keep asking God, keep communicating with God. And then as we behold the beauty of the Lord, for sure, the Lord's beauty will be slowly reflected in us as well. That is the most important thing for us 
in these last days. Because the Bible says, without holiness, no one shall see the Lord. The holiness, the beauty of the Lord is the character of God. We are told in the pen of inspiration, through the pen of inspiration, when the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced among his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. He is waiting for his own to come. In his prayer to the Father, he said, Father, I will that those thou whom, who has, whom thou hast given me shall be with me forever. Yes, the shepherd and the sheep, the savior and the saved, the redeemer and the redeemed have to be in one place and that is the Lord's desire. The one who hung 2,000 years ago on the cross of Calvary to forgive us, to empower us, and to see that the beauty of the Lord be upon us is promised, is promising he will come again. Yes, he's going to come again. We are living in the end of time. Very soon, the, the thoughts of the book of Revelation, the themes of the book of Revelation, especially the last phase when God's people will be persecuted because they have the seal of the living God. They choose to have the seal of the living God. Dear friends, we can have the seal of the living God only when we desire this one thing, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. To be more and more like Jesus. To be like the fruit of the Spirit, maturing in beauty and taste and in different colors and shades as well, spiritually speaking. Dear friends in the Lord, yes, we are living in perilous times. Jesus is soon going to come. Very soon, God's people who choose to seek after the beauty of the Lord, to, 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 those who choose to make the Lord their example, their model man for them to follow, they will be hated by the devil. For the Bible says in Revelation 12, verse 12, that the devil has come down having great wrath. And in verse 17, for the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Yes, in that very last phase, God's people will have to leave their homes, their cities, and whichever place they dwell in, because people will be following them. But the Lord is there with us. Yea, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil, for thou art with us, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort us. Yes, Isaiah chapter 33, 16 and 17 talks about that phase wherein God's people will be hiding in the mountains and in the caves. I read Isaiah 33, 16 and 17. He shall dwell on high. In other words, he means God's people. He or she are God's people. Shall dwell on high. Oh, dear friends in the Lord, let's dwell on high today by faith under the shadow of his wings. And then the Bible says, his place of defense, praise God, he is the defense. He is the shield. He is our buckler. He is our fortress. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into, into it and is safe. I read, he shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be the munition of rocks. Not their homes, not the concrete homes, but the munition of rocks will be the homes wherein God has prepared God's people to take refuge at the very end of time when they will be hated by the whole world. Bread shall be given him, praise God. Bread shall be given him, his waters shall be sure. Our basic necessities of shelter, of bread and water shall be supplied by the Lord. Amen, that is enough. And then in verse 17, thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty. And they shall behold the land that is very far off. What are we talking about, dear friends, today? The beauty of the Lord. For those who have got used to accustomed to seeing the beauty of the Lord by faith on a daily, regular basis, inquiring in his temple on a daily, regular basis, would have the beauty of the Lord upon them and they would be given that beautiful opportunity to see the king coming. How is he coming? In all his splendor and glory. 
is coming in all his beauty, then I shall see the king in his beauty, and they shall behold the land that is very far off. Dear friends, today we are pilgrims and strangers in this land called earth. But very soon, if we are faithful, if we behold the beauty of the Lord, and the beauty of the Lord be upon us, we will see the king in his beauty when he comes, and we shall go to the land that is very far off. Yes, there's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it afar. Dear friends in the Lord, God has given us time upon this earth, not to spend for nothing or to spend it in vanity, but to seek the Lord, to inquire in his temple, to come into his presence, to desire the beauty of the Lord, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and being changed into the same image, having the beauty of holiness being reflected upon us. And very soon, the culmination or the consummation of all things will be the king coming. And this king had full of the beauty of the Lord while he walked as a human being 2,000 years ago. Today, he's calling us to reflect his beautiful character. Friends, make it your point. Make it your decision to seek the Lord, his glory, his beautiful face, and the beauty of his holiness. And the Lord will bless us with the beauty of the Lord. And finally, not only with the beauty of the Lord be filled, being filled with, with through the power of the Holy Spirit upon his people, we would also see the beauties of the new earth, wherein there will be no blight of sin. I want to go home. What about you? May we make our preparation ready. God bless us all with the beauty of the Lord. Amen.